Welcome everyone to this fourth session in our series on evidence based person centered interventions for delirium prevention, mitigation and recovery. We are the, the QIO for 7 states and I serve as the lead for the community coalitions and the nursing homework and it's been my privilege to bring this series to you. Our speaker today, as it has been in the first three of our series, is Dr. Christine Wisninski, who's the coordinator of inpatient geriatric services at Hartford Hospital and is the past uh, president of the American Delirium Society. Uh, Dr. Wisninski has performed these webinars for us and also recorded a series of bite sized learning on the same topic and implementation of delirium clinical pathways that you can use for staff education in your facilities. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Wisniewski, for this last session. Very good. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm looking forward to finishing up the series with you. So what we're going to hope to accomplish today is to talk about how to determine appropriate non-pharmacological interventions for patients that are and families that are at risk for or experiencing delirium, and also to discuss approaches to make such a program possible in your organization so that uh, these items and these approaches are available and easy to integrate. So where is the evidence? Just to review what we talked about last week when we were discussing, or last time, when we, did, we were discussing pharmacological interventions, that the current evidence does not support the use of medications to either prevent or treat delirium. We do know that selected patients that are experiencing very severe hyperactive symptoms and suffering from them may benefit from a short-term low-dose antipsychotic therapy. However, the mainstay of um, prevention and mitigation strategies for persons with delirium are non-pharmacological measures. So that's what I'll be presenting to you today is, again, everything that I'll be sharing with you has been studied and is evidence-based. And we do have studies that have demonstrated positive outcomes for either preventing delirium or um, decreasing distress in patients that are currently experiencing it from implementing the interventions that I'll be sharing. Most of the studies have looked at this as a multi-component individualized set of interventions. Um, some of the studies did study one or two separately, but again, the recommendation is often to consider these as a, um, as a set and then to pick, the, pick and choose those that seem appropriate for that patient based on their profile. So I'm going just to refer here again to a tool that I introduced in the first session. This is our delirium care pathway. And we're going to be talking about the circled areas in magenta, which is what are some of the preventative strategies under DETER for someone that is at risk for delirium? And then what do we do when a patient does display delirium? And what do we do initially? And then what do we do daily until that delirium is resolved? So I want to introduce you to the TADA approach. If you've never heard of it, this is work by Dr. Joseph Flaherty, uh, published work. And this is an approach that can be used very successfully in patients, particularly those that have altered mental status, either from dementia, delirium, or combinations of both. What we know is that often the way that we approach or react to patients can actually make or break the situation. <laughs> So, so we want to make sure that we're responding in the most optimal way to get the best outcome that we would like, which is to keep the patient calm, happy, and dignified. So an example of TADA, ta the T first T stands for tolerate. So we want to be able to tolerate behaviors that perhaps that we don't think are optimal for that patient, but that um, we don't really want to pick a fight over. So an example of that might be a patient that wants to keep their hat on while they're sleeping. It's not going to be dangerous. It, again, it's not something that we would advocate for, but it's not going to hurt the patient. So we would just let that happen. The A stands for anticipate. So we would be thinking ahead of time, what might happen or what situation that we know is going to occur 
um, might upset the patient and how might we intervene for that so that we don't get that outcome. So an example would be if the family's been with the patient all day and the family's getting ready to leave, we know that that patient might start to get a little bit restless and frightened after the patient, after the family leaves. So we would be trying to put some interventions in place to either distract that patient or make them feel calm and safe. And the DA stands for don't agitate. So this is where we do not want to intervene in or do anything to a patient or with a patient that's going to make them feel frightened or agitated. So for example, your patient keeps trying to get out of bed. Um, what we want to do instead of telling them to get back into bed, pushing them down into the bed, restraining them onto the bed would be to try to figure out why is it that they want to get out of bed, help that patient get out of bed, and then try to meet the need of what the patient is trying to accomplish, whether that's that they need to move around and wander, they need to go to the bathroom, they're hungry, they're bored, etc. So again, looking at Joe Flaherty's work can be very helpful um, as a preventative strategy and also to use it as your patient is displaying delirium. So to help us with this is uh, to get to know your patient um, as a person. And that's often hard to do when you have someone with altered mental status because they often can't tell you and they can't answer. So this was an example of a, um, a, a whiteboard that we created uh, at where I work. Uh, called we called it Hartford Healthcare Cares About Me. You'll see other versions that are available. It's it's kind of what they call an all about me poster. And on that poster, you would gather information from someone that knows the patient and could figure out what that patient likes to be called. So again, you might be using a nickname, or it might be a full a full formal name that the patient prefers. Uh, you would be asking them about what kind of work they did do or what kind of work they are currently doing, what are their favorite hobbies or TV shows, um, tell a little bit about their family, friends, and pets, so you can write that in that section, et cetera. So again, this could be very useful when a patient starts to get uh, agitated. So I'll give an example. I was uh, cutting a, a patient's toenails once and she was starting to get very restless and agitated. And I looked over at the board and I saw that she liked the Red Sox. So I started to engage her in a conversation and said, so um, I went to Fenway Park last weekend. Um, have you ever been there? And then she started to engage. Um, she, she started talking about the players from the past. Uh, and so I was able to continue the work I was doing with her, but she was much more uh, calm and much more distracted. This is a slide that just kind of basically uh, groups together the types of non-pharmacological strategies or interventions that we would consider to prevent or treat delirium. So um, some of them are about meeting bodily needs, such as pain relief, uh, elimination, needing to move around and mobilize, uh, satisfying hunger or thirst. Some of them are about accommodating deficits, such as vision and hearing. Uh, some of them are about avoiding or limiting intrusive uh, devices or uh, interventions such as um, avoiding tethers and, or disguising tethers, um, avoiding deliriogenic medications, um, and others are about making the patient feel comfortable by um, implementing routines and, familiar, and bringing in familiar items. So I'm going to talk about some of these a little bit more in detail in the following slides. So around sleep enhancement, rest and relaxation. So our goal again is to have, have our patient be able to get rest and sleep as appropriate so that they can recover. So um, the, the interventions that are suggested is eye shields and earplugs. Again, these have been tested and they have been very successful in preventing delirium as well as even in use in patients with delirium, particularly even in the ICU setting. Um, trying to minimize waking that patient up so that we're allowing them to get into the deeper stages of REM sleep, which they need to heal. So we do that by trying to group um, interventions that we need to do, such as blood draws, vital signs, et cetera, um, trying to get the person a good night's sleep. And even in some cases, putting up a sign that the patient is not to be disturbed between 
uh, 12, midnight, and 6 a.m. as long as that patient is stable enough to um, have that plan of care. Um, making sure that the room is light during the day and darker at night, that it's not extremely noisy, and then using some prompts to help for people to go to sleep, such as white noise, um, other types of relaxation sounds, uh, preferred music. Uh, we also can use um, techniques such as back rubs, a Reiki, uh, imagery and medic meditation, all to bring that person into a space where they're much calmer and they can rest. When we have a patient that needs sensory enhancement, so this could mean that either their vision and hearing or touch needs to be stimulated, but also to be sure that we're using the appropriate type of stimulation and level of stimulation, so we don't want to over or under stimulate our patient. So this is where we want to make sure that we have eyeglasses if the patient wears them to wear them appropriately or to have cheater glasses available for patients that want to read that didn't bring their glasses. Uh, making sure that we have their hearing aids in if they wear them, that the batteries are working, or that we use other hearing amplification devices to assist that patient so that we can communicate with them. There's been studies done on virtual reality glasses for patients, um, and they can be very helpful for certain patients. So we can uh, program them to uh, for familiar uh, places or, um, vi or, or pleasant uh, views. Uh, we've had patients that we want to um, use stimulation to their senses, a sense of touch. So one patient that we had that was uh, visually impaired, she really enjoyed uh, uh, touching costume jewelry and kind of feeling it on her fingers and then putting it around, putting different necklaces around her neck and earrings and such. She recognized it by, by touch. That was a very successful intervention for her. Some patients enjoy making uh, sand um, types of uh, designs uh, using Play-Doh, squishy balls, um, snow globes can be very uh, entertaining for patients or anything that that moves about in fluid. An example of that are the bubble tubes that you see in this um, in this uh, photo here. And as you'll see, uh, you'll see other pictures of this bubble tube, and you'll see it changing colors. But we always ask the patients, "What's your favorite color on this?" But this this is very mesmerizing, not only for patients but the staff as well. Love to come in and stand in front of it, and they talk about how relaxing it feels. Um, this is uh, our, our example of how to provide orientation as well as cognitive stimulation for patients because, again, we want to preserve their cognition and they need to keep exercising it while they are ill or in other uh, healthcare settings. So the most common that we normally use would be clocks and calendars to keep our patients on track with dates and times of day. Um, any kind of schedule or routine that can be put in place can be very helpful for keeping patients on track. Uh, also reminiscing with patients, but using visual prompts. So an example of that might be, um, you know, we're going to talk about like the, the, the uh, example I gave earlier about um, Fenway Park. We might get a book of, uh, of ballparks and be looking at a picture of Fenway Park to kind of help that person to make that connection. Uh, with a visual prompt, as well as um, discussing uh, pleasant memories. Card games can be very fun for patients, whether they're solitaire, um, playing actual games with each other, or sometimes we just ask patients to sort the reds and the blacks or the, um, the clubs and the spades, uh, again, depending on their level of um, intellect at the time. Adult coloring is very, very positive. Uh, art therapy, and then for patients that enjoy word searches, crosswords, chess or checkers, jigsaw puzzles are all uh, examples of other ways to keep uh, the patient's cognition stimulated. Um, you'll see the patient on the right hand side is building a pipe tree. This is a, um, a device that we found extremely interesting, interesting to many men that um, like to build things. It comes with blueprints, um, so it can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be. And then the last thing you'll see in the picture on the right um, in the back is a xylophone, and on the picture on the left is a, is a patient playing the piano. So let me see if the video works. It worked on my version. So anyway, 
let me describe what's going on here. This is a gentleman that has a chest tube, an IV. Uh, we, we had him in his room and we asked him, what would make your day today, sir? And he said, if I could only play my piano. So we brought him to our multi-sensory stimulation room, which happens to have a baby Grand Steinway. And he sat and he played the uh, a Chopin um, waltz from memory. And then we found that he was a retired professor from a local college uh, and he was a professor of, of music. So he really enjoyed that. But you can see uh, someone that's quite ill can still often engage in these types of, um, in these types of activities that give them comfort and joy. Um, in addition, we wanna make sure that the patient is always um, comfortable physically and emotionally. So we wanna make sure that temperature is appropriate because patients that are too cold or too hot will not be able to rest and then can often get agitated and if they can't speak up about what's wrong. We wanna make sure they're moving about so that they're not stuck in one position and getting stiff. Um, we can use massage, Reiki, and other types of uh, touch therapies for them. This patient here you're going to see is receiving doll therapy. So again, this is a, um, an evidence-based strategy. This uh, woman had advanced dementia and she really enjoyed taking care of her babies. So her babies were always with her uh, in, in when she was in bed, when she was up, when she traveled to our multi-sensory stimulation room that you see here and she had multiple babies. Uh, and she would take care of them and uh, feed them, dress them, et cetera. And this brought her a great amount of joy and comfort. Um, so other things that you might do as well would be pet therapy. If you have such programs, pets can bring so much pleasure to um, individuals. In this situation, we had a stuffed animal that we were using. We've also used robotic pets that have been extremely helpful and evidence-based. Uh, they, they are cats and dogs that um, interact with patients. Uh, and we've used them multiple times, uh, continued with, with great success. Uh, we did a study um, in my hospital of, uh, we wanted to see, uh, did providing these individualized therapeutic activities really make a difference to decrease agitation? So we had uh, 74 agitated patients over a six month period that had a sitter with them. And what we did was we uh, found out what was their interest and ability, and then we intervened with activities that were appropriate. And then what we found was, if you look um, at the pie charts, during the activity, we were able to reduce um, agitation in 73% of the patients. And then we followed them for another hour to see after we stopped the activity, did the uh, decrease in agitation persist? And 64% of those patients were still calm and uh, comfortable after an hour of stopping the activity. So we did see some prolonged effect from this intervention. Mobilization was another one of the non-pharmacological interventions that's been shown to either prevent or to uh, mitigate delirium. So Dr. Inouye, in her uh, classic work around her hospital elder life program, also known as HELP, uh, uses volunteers to uh, do a multi, um, multi uh, factorial interventions for patients. And one of those is walking patients and doing mobility activities with them if they are unable to, to mobilize or walk, excuse me. And she was able to demonstrate uh, decreases in delirium, uh, cognitive and functional decline and length of stay, hospital costs and institutionalization by this project. Uh, Brown's work was able to show that if we were able to um, continue to mobilize patients to their maximum during hospitalization, with a progressive mobility protocol, uh, these patients were able to uh, maintain their uh, mobility, uh, their, their baseline mobility up to one month after following discharge. So, and lastly, Dr. Uh, Devlin's work uh, around the um, prevention and management of pain, agitation, sedation, delirium, immobility, and sleep disruption guidelines that are updated regularly for the ICU uh, they promote early mobility in the ICU, found it to be safe and effective, particularly around delirium prevention and mitigation. 
uh, at our hospital, we use the modified Dion's egress test as a way to be sure that our patient is safe and able at this point in time to move away from the bed. So we know that our physical therapy partners often see patients and they uh, make recommendations for uh, how much assistance that patient would need for mobilization. However, we also know that the patient is a moving target. Uh, they may walk fine with minimal assist in the morning, but might be very tired in the evening or might have received a, a, a procedure, et cetera. So their status may have changed. So our policy is to um, do this test, brief test, every time a patient is planned to move away from the bedside for a planned walk. And we've been able to decrease assisted falls uh, significantly by doing a screening uh, before each mobilization. We also use gate belts and walkers for um, all of our mobilizations. And uh, we also have mobility volunteers that we've put in place to help us to mobilize patients. Uh, and um, we found, we've had uh, close to uh, 20,000 mobility episodes at this point, and um, it is very, it's found to be very safe. We did have three instances of falls. They were all very minor with no injury and they were mostly related to patients that were referred to the mobility volunteer that were uh, too complicated for, that, they ne that they should not have been working with that patient. So again, we found this to be a very positive intervention to help staff to mobilize patients. Also to get patients to do their own exercises. So anybody that's cognitively intact, you can tell them, you know, I want you to lift your leg off, each leg off the bed uh, 20 times. Um, and every hour and then keep track of it. You can write it down, et cetera. Um, again, you can remind them that this is their role to keep themselves um, active and healthy and strong. Um, and then uh, we also use weights at the bedside. So again, these are things that the nurses can implement with patients while you're in the room, while you're um, doing something in, in the, with the environment. So if the PCA is changing the bed and the patient's in the chair, they can be lifting weights. Uh, we have these pedal bikes that we use that patients can use for their feet and their hands uh, or arms uh, on an overbed table. So again, all to preserve strength. We had a patient in uh, one of our areas that insisted on using that pedal bike uh, multiple times a day. She was 100 years old. And all she kept saying was she wanted to, she wanted to preserve her power, her power so that she'd be able to move and walk and go home. She was right. <laughs> Uh, so this is an example of a card that we've designed for patients to fill out for themselves um, to keep track of what uh, mobilization interventions they're doing for themselves. So again, this is uh, one of the four M's is mobility uh, and they are doing this uh, on their own. So this takes no staff time and gets a great amount of, of results. Also families can get involved with this. If, you, if your patient has altered mental status, the family can be shown how to do these. And again, this is not hospital specific. This can be done in any care setting. For nutrition, hydration, and elimination, again, these are just some tips. We want to make sure that the person has the food that they're able to eat and that they like. Uh, if we are trying to get the person to get more calories, we can give supplements um, while we're giving them their medication so that they're getting both of those things at the same time, obviously helping them to eat when they need it uh, or giving them finger foods if that's something they can manage better or other types of assistive devices to help them eat on their own, to offer the patient something to drink every time that we go into their, uh, into their area, having them eat in a chair. Uh, there's evidence that shows that patients eat significantly more food if they are sitting up. Uh, also congregate dining whenever that's possible, uh, also encourages people to eat. Um, and then to make sure that they're not retaining urine, that they're not constipated, uh, promoting normal elimination by using uh, the toilet or commode or urinal for gentlemen uh, and having a toileting uh, regimen. So we know that constipation and urinary retention are drivers of delirium. Um, also, getting the family involved, as I mentioned earlier, at any level, encouraging the family to be present for these patients. They are often a very calming force and can be a huge resource that we don't often 
utilized. And you can see here the bubble tubes are turning green. <laughs> this is a study that I did um, because I, I had real, recognized that some patients, when the family is present, they are calm. When the family is not present, they are agitated. So what I wanted to study was if I created a one minute family video that I played for that patient, um, either on an iPad or on a small DVD player, would that make them less agitated? So what we found here was that 96% of the patients that received that family video decreased their agitation while they were watching it, and 80% of them were still less agitated um, one minute after the video, and 70% were still less agitated 30 minutes after the video. We also compared this to uh, a nature video, and nature video also was effective in decreasing agitation, but it was not as effective as the family video. Uh, these are some strategies to either con uh, conceal um, medical devices when you cannot remove them. So again, we always want to remove or avoid anything that we don't absolutely need, but if we need it, so these are skin sleeves to cover. We've got a, a activity apron that can cover a urinary catheter or an abdominal um, wound. Uh, and we also have uh, pajama pants with a tie. And again, you can um, you know, alter these things with long sleeves shirts to cover up devices so that the patient doesn't see them. We've also used um, fake telemetry wires. When a patient needs telemetry and they're pulling on their wires, we give them a set of telemetry wires to hold in their hands that they can fiddle with so that they're not fiddling with the real thing. Uh, this is some um, um, literature, uh, the ABCDEF bundle, which is specific to ICU uh, for delirium prevention and mitigation. So those of you that are in the ICU, you might want to, if you're not familiar with this work, you should take a look at it. It's again, very structured and it has shown very positive outcomes um, around uh, decreasing death, uh, ventilation use, um, mental status, uh, physical restraints and uh, readmissions. Uh, if you are able to bring volunteers into your setting, this is a very helpful way to, um, to as an adjunct to, to helping uh, to administer some of these non-pharmacological interventions, as well as keeping the items that you need for the staff to use available to them. And I'm gonna end just by showing you um, some, some, uh, an area that we created here at Hartford Hospital called the Therapeutic Hub. This is a multi-sensory stimulation area for patients that we bring so that they get them out of their room to come to a different setting that doesn't look like the hospital. And uh, I, I've um, provided a link to a voiceover PowerPoint for anybody that's interested in more details. But these are some of the things we have in the hub. So there's that piano I told you about. We have all these visual pleasing screens and scenes. We have uh, glider chairs, a massage chair, um, a variety of activities that we have for patients to participate in, a, uh, a visual um, in the, in the uh, ceiling of something that's more pleasant than a regular ceiling tile, and then we do have um, exercise equipment. There's those uh, pedal bikes again, and we also actually have a large piece of equipment that um, we can use for um, people that are more able to do um, higher level exercising. And uh, we uh, have been studying this area for uh, effectiveness, and uh, anecdotally, we saw agitation, going down, improved eating, mobilization, improved mood, patients making statements such as they feel like home, they feel more normal. Um, all of those words in the wordle there were words that the patients used to describe their experience there. And uh, again, our studies are showing that uh, this intervention may normalize arousal levels, so it can help to uh, work with patients in hypo or hyperactive deliriums, and also um, patients that are at risk for delirium. We do have a randomized controlled trial that's currently being analyzed. So there are some references here for you. Um, hopefully you will uh, follow up. We do have our American Delirium Society Conference coming up in June. 
encourage you all to consider attending. And I hope that we met the objectives today for you to become more aware of some of the uh, individualized strategies that you might use for people at risk for delirium or experiencing, as well as how to um, perhaps implement some of these at, in a program at your facility so that they could be available and, and used on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And as you have in every one of these sessions, you've crammed a lot of great information into a short amount of time. Uh, we did have a question in chat about the availability of those slides. And yes, they are available, available in the Alliance Health Services webpage and our delirium subtopic section. We've devoted a whole section to delirium because we believe this is such an impactful topic for uh, both our um, acute care and post acute care partners. And Dennis is chatting that into our uh, chat session as well. And I don't believe we have any other questions. Do you have, have you seen those, uh, your hub room set up in your long term care areas or do you just have a hub in the hospital setting currently? So right now we have it just in the hospital, but we have a lot of interest in our um, partners from our uh, skilled nursing facilities for post-acute as well as long-term that are in the process of setting up similar areas. Great, so I do believe we are out of time, but thank you again for presenting this great information and these webinars as well as the bite-sized learning videos that can be used for training of, of your staff are available on the Alliant Quality website at quality.alliantehealth.org. And we welcome your feedback on today's event, as well as information on how we can serve you with additional topics moving forward. So that'll conclude our webinar for today.